It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sentel today, uh, who's our uh, visitor and our um, colloquium speaker. I I speaker. So um, Sentel started his uh, undergrad degree in, uh, in, in India, and then he came as a PhD student uh, to uh, Yale. Uh, he did his postdoc in uh, uh, Santa Barbara, and, uh, and then started a, a faculty uh, position at uh, MIT. He was also a faculty a, a member at uh, a Bangalore and a distinguished member of the uh, Perimeter Institute. Um, so uh, Sentel uh, worked on a very uh, a wide variety of uh, topics in uh, condensed matter physics, ranging from uh, disordered systems to high-TC superconductors. The sort of uh, um, recurring theme in Sentel's work is that he would work on what I might call uh, unconventional condensed matter physics. So basically, uh, whenever the uh, standard theories of condensed matter fail, that's where you'll find Sentel. So he's been uh, a, a, a pioneer in the field of uh, fractionalization, a, a applications of uh, a, a concepts from high energy theory to, to uh, condensed matter physics like gauge theories, a critical phenomena beyond the Landau par par paradigm topological order, a quantum spin liquid. So a, in short, I would say that uh, whenever you're working on uh, a, 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 a problem in condensed matter physics and uh, you reach the end of the conventional theory, so Landau doesn't help you, uh, that's where you call Sentel to the rescue. So uh, uh, please. Uh, yeah, it's been wonderful to be here. I've been here for nearly a week now. Uh, first trip to Israel, first trip, and therefore first trip to Weizmann. Uh, uh, as you can see, I speak perfect Hebrew. Uh, so a challenge for you is to figure out how I learned to do this. It's not through Google. Uh, and it's, I'm told that it's a slight mispronunciation of my name. I pronounce it Sentil. Uh, apparently the H is missing from this thing. Anyway, so that's my title. Uh, uh, so all the work that I'm going to tell you about was done primarily with a fantastic collaborator who uh, turned out to be my student. Uh, though, you know, I learned a lot more from him than he learned from me. Uh, he's uh, now graduated and gone to Harvard. And there's uh, little collaboration with a number of other people. Uh, uh, Drew Porter, who's a postdoc at Berkeley now, and Adam Nahum, Minty Soderman, and Ithamar Kimchi, who are all postdocs at MIT. OK. Uh, uh, so presumably, uh, most of you have heard of topological insulators. Last 10 years in condensed matter physics, it's been a, a, a major uh, 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 theme of activity. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this possibility of topological insulators arises already in free electron band theory, and it turns out that there is two distinct insulating phases of electrons in the presence of time reversal symmetry. Uh, one of them is just a conventional band insulator, like silicon, uh, while the other is this new, uh, relatively new possibility known as the topological band insulator, which occurs in materials with strong spin-orbit coupling. Uh, and, which, uh, uh, and which has been studied in experiments in uh, many different systems. So, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist, and this entire field of topological insulators gives me great joy because it's really a triumph for theoretical physics. It came out of theory. It didn't come out of, uh, it wasn't discovered in the lab first. It was predicted by theory, uh, uh, primarily by Charlie Kane with some uh, uh, supporting work, uh, uh, Charlie Kane and Xu Cheng Zhang. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, beautiful initial work by my colleague, Ga Liang Fu, who was here till yesterday. Uh, uh, so the possibility that this thing could happen was realized by these people, and this prediction of real materials uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and uh, uh, so somewhat later there were experiments that confirmed the essence of these theoretical ideas. Right? Uh, so it's not often in solid state physics that uh, theory really leads the field, so this is a great example that it can happen. Uh, so uh, let me remind you of some of the properties of topological band insulators. And uh, the usual characterization is that even though they are insulators uh, uh, in the bulk, uh, real solids have surfaces. And at the surface, uh, that they are metallic, but they are unusual metals. They are unusual conductors. In two-dimensional systems, uh, uh, topological insulators sometimes called a quantum spin hall insulator. So what happens is that the bulk is insulating, but at the edge, you have uh, gapless edge modes, which are such that uh, they propagate in both directions, but the direction of propagation is tied to the spin of, of the electron. In three dimensions, something uh, even more interesting happens. 
the surplus consists of this famous uh, Dirac cone, where the electrons have a Dirac-like dispersion. And uh, 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 the there's a weird feature about this Dirac cone, namely that there's only an odd number of Dirac cones that exist at the surface of this 3D topological insulator. So why is the surface interesting? Uh, so within band theory, meaning non-interacting electrons, uh, you get a metallic surface in a bulk insulator, and that is by itself quite familiar in solid state physics. There are several insulators that do that. But the weird thing about this metallic state in this topological insulator is that you can, you can add any amount of impurities, uh, and so long as you preserve time reversal symmetry, you can never stop the conduction at the surface. Right? So this metallic state of the surface is protected against uh, localization of the charge carriers, irrespective of how, strong, how strongly disordered the surface is. Right? You can put any, dump any number of impurities, but so long as you preserve the symmetry of time reversal, it uh, stays metallic. Right? Uh, from a deeper theoretical point of view, uh, if, you have, if I have a d-dimensional topological insulator, then the surface theory is something that's impossible. Uh, the surface is a d minus one dimensional system, and this, uh, the theory that describes the surface is something that's impossible in a strictly d minus one dimensional solid with the same symmetries. This theory is only allowed to exist because it's the boundary of some higher dimensional thing. Okay? Uh, so as an example, the single massless Dirac cone that appears at the surface of the 3D topological insulator is uh, within band structure. It's been known for a long time that it's forbidden in a strictly two dimensional time reversal symmetric metal. But you know, it exists in nature at, this, at the boundary of the three-dimensional material. Okay? It's, uh, it turns out it's allowed to exist at the boundary of a 3D system, though it's not allowed to exist in a strictly two-dimensional system. So uh, all that is very interesting. It's very cool. Uh, but it, you know, it's 10-year-old stuff. Uh, so what are people working on now? Right? So a lot of the modern theoretical work is to understand the fate of topological insulators and regimes in which band theory doesn't necessarily work, right? to go beyond band theory. And one of the things that uh, we've recognized is that topolo the topological band insulators are a special case for more general class of phases of matter that we call symmetry protected topological phases, which may occur even when the electrons interact strongly with each other. And one way to think about what such a phase is is through a phase diagram of this sort. Uh, suppose I have a system of electrons or spins, so whatever your elementary degrees of freedom are. And this system, the Hamiltonians that, de that describes the system has some symmetry, some global symmetry. Uh, and in the presence of that symmetry, I have two phases that are sharply distinct from each other and that I can uh, reach by tuning some parameter in the Hamiltonian that preserves all the, this global symmetry. Okay? Uh, so these two phases are sharply distinct and I have to go through a phase transition to go from one to the other. But then, if I turn on a, a, a perturbation that removes this global symmetry, uh, then uh, I'm able to go smoothly around this phase transition and connect these two phases. Okay? So that's the situation. If, if you have that situation, uh, and uh, so then uh, the only reason these two phases are distinct, the distinction between these two phases is something that's protected by the global symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So there's a symmetry protected distinction between these two phases. And the particular case in which one of the phases is, to is a totally trivial insulator, uh, uh, then this phase is also essentially a totally trivial insulator, except that when the particular global symmetry is present, it's sharply distinct. But if you remove the symmetry, you can go smoothly from one to the other. So sta the standard topological band insulators that are, uh, and uh, ordinary insulators share this property that they are sharply distinct in the presence of uh, time reversal and charge conservation symmetries. But if I say turn on a magnetic field, I can go smoothly between the two. Okay? So if you define uh, a generalization of topological insulators to interacting systems through phase diagrams like this, uh, so then you can try and study what kinds of phases are separated from other uh, trivial phases through phase transitions, the presence of symmetry uh, 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 and which are such that if you remove the symmetry, they no longer become distinct. Right? Uh, so the study of these uh, uh, symmetry-protected topological phases 
should be contrasted with many of the interesting things that uh, Kenneth Spider physicists have studied in the last few decades. Uh, so one of the things we've studied uh, uh, of exotic phenomena like in the fractional quantum hall effect, we have fractional charge or uh, it, uh, you know in neonic statistics, abelian, non-abelian. You know, a lot of these things are you know heavily worked on here at Weizmann. Uh, so these are really cool phenomena, but in studying these topological insulators and their interacting generalizations of the kind that I defined, we don't allow any of these things. Okay. Uh, another theme in modern Kenneth matter physics in the last two decades, three decades, has been to look at phases and phase transitions uh, of matter, which at which there are no quasi-particle excitations at all. So the notion of a quasi-particle, which was so successful in 20th century Kenneth matter physics. Uh, we now recognize that it can sometimes fail completely, that you can just have some strongly interacting soup uh, of uh, a quantum mini body system in which there's no notion of a quasi particle that describes excitations. Right? Uh, so, in the study of these symmetry protected topological phases, we forbid all these cool things that we know can happen in quantum mini body systems. And after forbidding all these cool things, we want to ask whether anything interesting is still left. So it's sort of the minimal interest, give the material almost no chance to do any of the interesting things that we already knew of before and see if it can still have some life, right? So that's the goal. But, so, so the next question then is why, why should we play this game? Well, uh, you know, uh, why should we forbid all the cool things that we know can happen, right? Uh, so there's one really good motivation. It's that we know that these topological insulators exist in experiment initially discovered in this family, but uh, there's many, many more uh, that people have studied since then. And there's an even larger number of such uh, faces that we now understand are allowed to exist theoretically, and we understand their properties, though this, uh, many of them still await realization in experiments. Uh, so, you know, these kinds of phases exist in nature. Right? So that's perhaps the biggest reason why Kenneth matter physicists are interested. Uh, but there's another reason which is actually going to be the theme of this talk uh, to study these phases. It turns out, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, these phases are very, very simple, right? In the absence of symmetry, they are connected to totally boring trivial phases. A topological insulator, uh, if I turn on a magnetic field, is in the same phase of matter as a totally trivial insulator, right? Uh, uh, so in that sense, they are the simplest context perhaps to study the interplay of three distinct themes in modern condensed matter physics, the role of uh, symmetries, the role of topology, and the role of strong correlations between the particles that make up the system. And uh, uh, studying these questions in this very simplest context, it turns out has led to dramatic insights into more complex systems of the kind that we've always studied. Uh, we now have a much deeper understanding of fractional charge and fractional statistics uh, when they occur in models or materials. Uh, uh, through studying these very simple phases, we've obtained constraints on these very, very exotic phases where there are no quasi-particle excitations at all, uh, things that really challenge everything that we've learned in uh, kinetic spider physics in the last few, uh, in, in the many decades. Uh, uh, at a more general level, not just in kinetic spider, but even in quantum field theory, uh, studying these phases has led to uh, new kinds of relationships between different kinds of quantum field theories. Uh, uh, you know, these relationships are, belong to the genre of relationships known as dualities. And that, again, I think has been a lot of focus of study at this very institute. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this towards the end. And there's many, many interesting connections to many recent developments in the field theory, math, and even string theory literature. Uh, I won't talk about any, most of that simply because I don't understand it. Uh, uh, so what I would like to do in this talk is to give you a glimpse of some of these uh, ways in which the studies of topological insulators affects our thinking about much more complicated problems. Okay? Uh, so rather than just being some isolated thing that's nice, it's an experiment, and we study it, and then it's just an isolated chapter in, the, in a kind of matter textbook, uh, what we've realized in the last few years is that these kinds of uh, insulators, despite being very simple, are crucially connected conceptually 
to many other frontier problems in the field <laughs> that have been around for a long time. So, I'll, so this, what I meant in the title by saying this applied topological insulator, you know, uh, the, one of the most important applications of science is for other science. Uh, likewise, you know, we are theoret I'm a theoretical physicist, right? So one of the most important applications of a new theoretical development is to other parts of theoretical physics. So, uh, so I want to give you an, an, a glimpse into theoretical applications of topological insulators, meaning applications to theoretical physics. Okay. Uh, so I want to focus in particular on something that just became clear in the last one year. Uh, it's a, 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 a you know surprising and deep connection between three different research areas within condensed matter physics that uh, previously we didn't think were related at all. Uh, I'll explain what uh, you know each one of these uh, things means. I guess the hero is uh, uh, topological insulator. Uh, and as expected, when you have these weird connections between many different topics, there's all kinds of new results and insights that have changed completely our understanding of all three topics. Okay? So I want to start by giving you a very brief introduction to this uh, topic known as quantum spin liquids, to, this, uh, uh, to the state of matter known as a quantum spin liquid, uh, and uh, you know, describe one issue in, in the theory of these uh, quantum spin liquids. So a quantum spin liquid is something that occurs in a magnetic material, right? You imagine an insulator, which, uh, it has some local moments somewhere, and you model it as a spin system with some interactions, right? Uh, a system of interacting quantum spins on some lattice, right? perhaps with some symmetry. Uh, so conventionally, uh, in quantum condensed matter physics, when you talk about what such a collection of spins can do, uh, uh, the first thing that most human beings will think of is ferromagnetism. It was discovered in 600 BC, at least according to Wikipedia, uh, so it must be right. Uh, uh, actually, the more common form of magnetism is not ferromagnetism, it's anti-ferromagnetism. It was only discovered in the 1930s. Uh, so the picture of a ferromagnet is that all the spins are lined up. An anti-ferromagnet, they are frozen, but there's some periodic pattern in which the direction of ordering, uh, the direction of the spin oscillates. Uh, and the studies of magnetism led to the key concept of broken symmetry in, sol in condensed matter physics uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and an important observation about these familiar states of magnetic matter is that the prototypical ground state wave function, which is what's written out here, is, you know, it's, uh, you, you recognize that this is a direct product wave function of, uh, it's a direct product of the wave function of, of whatever the local degrees of freedom are. Uh, uh, now, these days, we know that a direct product wave function is something that has no quantum entanglement between the different local degrees of freedom. So in these wave functions, the spin at one site has zero entanglement with the spin at any other site. Okay? Uh, more generally, uh, when you go beyond prototypical wave functions, one would characterize the ground states of these uh, uh, broken symmetry states like these by saying that they are, the quantum entanglement in the ground state wave function is short-ranged so even though they have long-ranged ordering of the classical kind, uh, the quantum correlations are short-ranged. Right? And, and most of the study of quantum magnetism from the 1930s till the present is an elaboration of the concept of broken symmetry and other states, similar states, which have short-range quantum entanglement. So one of the most exciting things that's, that's happened in magnetism in the last you know, uh, many decades, happened in the last 10 years, and it now looks as though we have an experimental discovery of a qualitatively new kind of magnetism of, uh, of a ground state in a magnetic system that's totally different from anything that's ever been studied before in the you know, 2,600 year history. Uh, so the popular name for this is a quantum spin liquid. And uh, what distinguishes it, what makes it so exciting and different is the distinction in the structure of the ground state wave function there's no way in which one can think of that. There's no limit in which one can think of it as a direct product of local degrees of freedom. Rather, the ground state wave function should really think of as some superposition of some emergent loop-like degrees of freedom which have uh, formed a quantum superposition. So in these states of matter, the quantum entanglement between local degrees of freedom is long-ranged in space. Right? So in contrast to standard states in quantum magnetism, quantum spin liquids have long-range quantum entanglement which makes them 
qualitatively different. There's all kinds of new phenomena that are totally different from things that we are used to uh, in magnetism. So a rough description of what happens uh, is the following. The spins do not freeze even at zero temperature into some ordering uh, pattern, uh, but they fluctuate in time and space due to quantum zero point motion. Uh, so cartoon, which is very popular uh, and which captures some of the essential physics, is something like this. So each spin uh, in the, any snapshot of the wave function, in, uh, in there are configurations in which each spin grabs a partner and forms a spin singlet, an entangled pair, a bell pair. Uh, and you can cover the lattice with these uh, entangled pairs of spins. But then the full ground state wave function is a quantum superposition of many different such configurations. Okay? Uh, so there's resonance between many different configurations of singlets that each spin, uh, that pairs of spins have formed with each other. Okay? Uh, so given this weird structure of the ground state wave function, we might expect that we need a new paradigm to describe these states of matter. And indeed, uh, uh, the theory of quantum spin liquids uh, involves uh, new kinds of objects to describe their collective behavior. There's emergence of gauge interactions, there's emergence of fractional quantum numbers, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what does all this have to do with topological insulators? Right? So these are really cool things. Uh, again, one of the most exciting developments in magnetism in decades. But uh, what's the relationship with topological insulators? Uh, so, uh, one lesson from rec the recognition that topological insulators exist is the following. That symmetry can protect distinction between two phases, neither of which breaks the symmetry. Okay? In standard kinetic matter physics, you, we know that if one phase breaks the symmetry and something else doesn't, they are sharply distinct. But here, in the topological insulator, we have two phases, neither of which breaks any symmetry, but they are still distinct from each other in the, pres in the presence of the symmetry. Right? And if you remove the symmetry, the distinction goes away. Right? Uh, so once we recognize that this kind of thing can happen for band insulators, we can ask the same question for quantum spin liquids. So if you have a quantum spin liquid in a magnetic system where the spin Hamiltonian has some global symmetry, maybe it's time reversal invariant, maybe it's spin rotation invariant, and so on, so then we can ask, are there different classes of quantum spin liquids? Let's say spin liquid A and spin liquid B, which are sharply distinct from each other, so long as this global symmetry is present. But once they remove that global symmetry, these two spin liquids become smoothly connected to each other. Okay? In other words, both of them have the same no structure of non-local quantum correlations in their ground state wave function, but the way in which symmetry is realized is different. Okay? Uh, and this issue is much more serious and much more subtle, uh, uh, actually, no, uh, 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 yeah, uh, in a spin liquid than it is in a band insulator. Because as I just said, in a spin liquid, the symmetry can be fractionalized. You can have fractional quantum numbers for excitations. So the way in which symmetry acts is much more brutal uh, in a for the excitations in a quantum spin liquid than in a, say, band insulator. So the symmetry distinctions can be much more severe than for band insulators. Okay? Uh, and uh, how topolo the topological insulators help us in a, in a very direct way in analyzing the various possibilities for quantum spin liquids in the presence of global symmetries. And there's a key idea that's uh, uh, helped us a lot in, this, uh, uh, in, in understanding this issue. Uh, so, uh, and the idea is to First, understand, say, one of these spin liquids. Uh, let me call it spin liquid uh, A. And you determine all the quasi-particles, if they exist, of spin liquid A. Uh, and symmetry acts on them in some way. And then you take one of these quasi-particles. You know, symmetry acts on it in some way. And you put that quasi-particle itself in a topological insulator uh, state, right? which then changes the way in which symmetry acts on the full system, on all the other quasi-particles. Right? And you get a different phase of the same spin liquid where the symmetry implementation is different. Okay? Uh, uh, so that's a way in which by starting from one spin liquid with a certain symmetry implementation, you can construct other spin liquids with different symmetry implementations. Right? And the relationship between the two is that you start with the quasi-particles of this state, and one of these quasi-particles itself then forms a topological insulator, and that then takes you to another phase. Okay? So that's one way in which top, uh, uh, 
understanding topological insulators has helped us in the theory of quantum spin liquids. So let me quickly give you an example where this kind of thinking was very successful. So I want to talk specifically about quantum spin liquids in three dimensions, which have this wonderful phenomenon where there's a photon-like collective mode that emerges at low energies. So there is a dream that people had in the 19th century that all of you know about, that uh, electromagnetism, uh, you know, uh, light, can be understood as a collective mode of some medium, the ether. Right? So this, of course, died uh, post Michelson, Morley, Einstein, whatever. Uh, but if you think about it, really, this was a challenge for condensed matter physicists. Right? Uh, you know, is there any medium at all whose collective modes will look like photons? Right? Can Maxwell's equations emerge as the long wavelength description of any medium? Right? In the 19th century, uh, I don't think people answered that question. Right? They just said maybe there's some such medium. But there's a version of this question in the 21st century, uh, now that we know quantum mechanics. You know, are there quantum phase of matter, perhaps just to keep things simple, of spin or boson systems with an emergent excitation that behaves like a photon? Okay? It's a quantum version of ether. Right? Uh, and the answer, uh, as we've learned uh, you know, the last uh, 15 years or so, is that such phase can indeed exist in certain quantum spin liquids of uh, 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 spins in three dimension. And there's some terminology that's very useful to think uh, in describing this state. Uh, we call it a U1 quantum spin liquid, as there's an emergent U1 gauge field associated with the photon. So I'll use that terminology. Uh, uh, so if you look at the excitations of the spin liquid, uh, uh, there's a gapless photon, of course. Uh, you know, it's not the real photon of the real outside ordinary universe, but it's some internal collective motion of the spins in the system, so we'll call it an artificial photon. <coughs> but it turns out that this doesn't come for free. It necessarily comes with other point-like particles which couple the photon. Uh, uh, one of them couples as a magnetic monopole, and another of them couples as an electric monopole, an electric charge. Right? So the emergence of the photon in such a lattice condensed matter system requires necessarily that there are also gapped electric and magnetic charges, or not necessarily gapped, but that there are electric and magnetic charges that also emerge as part of the same baggage. Right? Uh, so everything comes together. Uh, and there's many, many microscopic models for phase of this sort. Uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, uh, analytic work, numerical work. Yeah? So in what sense is it just like a photon? Is it massless? And it's massless. So it's polarization. Exactly. There's two polarizations. It's linear dispersing. The long wavelength description is just Maxwell, free Maxwell theory. But, you know, it necessarily comes with these other excitations. You, you know, if you throw these out, it, this, just this alone can't emerge. So what about experiments? It, in, the, in the last few years, uh, there have been in very, very interesting suggestions that this kind of phase may actually exist in some fairly complicated materials, uh, which I won't bother reading out. Uh, it, it turns out we also know the microscopic models that describe uh, at least some of these materials, but these models are very, very complicated and they're really hard to solve. Uh, they're definitely important, I mean, hard to solve analytically, but they're even really hard to solve numerically. They can't be simulated and so on, except in special limits. And, and uh, uh, we don't know yet, uh, we don't have completely confident, uh, we can't make a confident claim that the spin liquid actually exists in any of these materials, but this is a very active area of experimental research. There's a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, discussion going on on whether this actually happens here. Uh, uh, and one feature of the Hamiltonians that describe these uh, systems is that uh, uh, there's no symmetry at all in the Hamiltonian, no global symmetry except time reversal. You know, time reversal is a very natural symmetry in, in say, a spin system. Uh, unless you apply a magnetic field, you will have time reversal symmetry. Uh, there's also lattice symmetry, space group, but uh, that's only there. That's a less robust symmetry. Depends on there not being any impurities. Okay. Uh, so in this context, there's a very interesting conceptual question that one can ask. We know that we have some complicated spin Hamiltonian, which has almost no symmetry except time reversal, and we suspect that it may ha have this U1 
spin liquid phase with an emergent photon. So how many such phases are allowed in the presence of time reversal symmetry? In other words, are there distinct phases which are distinct, uh, uh, distinct U1 spin liquid phases which, whose distinction is symmetry protected, protected by the time reversal symmetry? Uh, so we solved this problem recently, about a year back, uh, and the answer turns out to be very surprising. It turns out there's exactly seven families of such phases, and they're related to each other by putting these emergent E or M particles, electric or magnetic charges, in their own topological insulators. Right? You start with one such phase, you take the E particle, put it in a topological insulator, you get another phase, and so on. If you wish, you can, uh, for high energy theorists in the room, if there exist any, you can think of this as a classification of U and gauge theories with time reversal symmetry. You know, the answer that the seven seems surprising to me. I don't think I'd heard that from my high energy friends before. Okay. Uh, so, okay, one answers this kind of question by using insights from topological insider theory. Uh, uh, and surprisingly, you know, this question, which was, uh, which I motivated for you by talking about the uh, emergence of photons and uh, these rare earth oxides and so on, this question is intertwined with many other profound issues in condensed matter physics. Right? Uh, uh, so that brings me back to this uh, chart. Uh, so this is what I described so far. Uh, so next, what I want to do is to change gears completely and describe this totally different topic of a two-dimensional electron gas in the quantum hole regime. So what a spin liquid in three dimensions has to do with a 2D electron gas in the quantum hole regime is, uh, you know, that's the interesting connection. Right? Uh, hopefully, as uh, all of you know, the most dramatic phenomenon that happens in a 2D electron gas in the quantum hole regime is the, uh, or the integer and fractional quantum hole effects. Remind you, a hole effect is a phenomenon where you run a current through a 2D, through any sample this way, and you get a voltage in the transverse direction. And in a 2D electron gas and high fields, you see this uh, famous uh, uh, quantization of the Hall conductivity. Yes, here is the plot of rho xy versus magnetic field. Uh, there's various filling fractions where the density of electrons is commensurate with the density of magnetic flux. You see a plateau here at filling factor one. And uh, you go further, you see fra the fractional quantum Hall effect and so on and so forth. Now, the quantum Hall effect has, of course, been one of the you know, most exciting and interesting uh, topics, uh, discoveries in condensed matter physics in what, 40 years, 35 years, something like that. Uh, and the framework to thinking about the quantum Hall effect is to start with the theory of non-interacting electrons in a field in two dimensions. And they, of course, form Lando levels with some uh, frequency, with some spacing set by the cyclotron frequency. Uh, and the integer quantum Hall effect is understood uh, to arise when electrons fill an integer number of these Lando levels. And the fractional quantum Hall effect arises when you fill certain rational fractions of a Lando level. And when you fill a fraction of a Lando level, then in the non-interacting picture, there's a huge degeneracy of many body states. And that degeneracy will be lifted by the interactions. Right? So clearly, the fractional quantum Hall effect is an interaction-dominated phenomenon. You can't describe it within a single particle uh, uh, description. Uh, and this uh, amazing phenomenon, this fractional charge and fractional statistics, uh, uh, the fractional charge was uh, predicted by Bob Laughlin in 1983 and observed right out here in Weizmann and uh, in Moti Heidblum's group uh, in 1997, and many other people also contributed. Uh, and the low, we understand that this low energy effective field theory of the fractional quantum Hall state is something that uh, uh, of tremendous interest in mathematical physics. It's something known as uh, chern simons theory. The top, what's known as the topological field theory. Uh, so, you know, quantum Hall effect connects to so many other things. It's uh, exciting, deep, uh, uh, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to talk about is what happens when the filling fraction is half. So in this trace, that's what happens right out here. It's exactly half as many electrons as the reflex quanta. Okay? If you look at this plot of rho xy, uh, that's basically where nothing happens, right? Uh, so I'm going to focus on the part of this plot where nothing happens, okay? So the question is, why should one bother? Uh, uh, if, you know, there's one, reason, one immediate reason to bother because nothing happening is also a very significant statement, right? When you have electrons that half fill a Lando level, 
Uh, there's still a huge degeneracy of many body states at so the level of uh, non-interacting electrons. And uh, the degeneracy is going to be lifted by interactions. And the question is, you know, what is the state that's produced uh, in this interaction-dominated phase that allows it to just be a, what looks like a featureless metal? You know, this is a plot to the, this is the longitudinal resistivity, and it also more or less doesn't do anything. It's non-zero. Uh, it's an experiment. It's a metal. And, uh, you know, Bert Happerin is uh, one of the big leaders and uh, leading theorists in the quantum Hall effect, calls it the unquantized quantum Hall effect. So the big question is, how do interactions on a half fill lander level enable produce a metal? Right? So usually a metal is something in which electrons move because of kinetic energy. But here, you know, in the strong magnetic field, the kinetic energy is quenched. It's all interactions. So somehow, just through interactions, you need to be able to produce a metal. Okay? Uh, so this problem attracted a lot of attention uh, 25 years back. And it was a major theme of research in the 1990s. Uh, and there was a theory produced for this uh, state of matter by Halperin, Lee, and Reed, HLR, uh, in 1993. And uh, the key idea behind this theory was to make use of an earlier idea due to Jane, uh, which said that let's imagine right, that each electron grabs two of the externally applied flux, magnetic flux quanta to form a new kind of particle. Right? And this combination of an electron bound to two flux quanta is uh, still a fermion. And uh, Jane called this a composite fermion. And since uh, uh, each electron has grabbed two flux quanta, this new particle sees a reduced magnetic field, uh, which is just the difference of the external field and minus uh, the number of uh, 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 since two flux quanta times the density of the underlying electron gas. Right? So it's a reduced effective field. Now the filling fraction is nu equals half, then this effective field seen by the composite fermions is zero. Uh, so then you might expect that these composite fermions move in straight lines, even though the electrons move in cyclotron orbits. Right? And since they are fermions, you might expect that they form a Fermi surface, and, that you, and that's how you get a metal. Right? So Fermi surface form not out of electrons, but out of these composite fermions. Okay? So as you can see, this place where nothing happens, actually something really dramatic happens. You get a really weird metal with a Fermi surface, even though you have a big magnetic field that you apply. But, but it's not a Fermi surface of electrons, it's a Fermi surface of weird objects. But this is actually the world's best understood known Fermi liquid phase of matter. It's an effective theory that uh, you can write down uh, based on this kind of thinking. And it takes the form of uh, Lagrangian for these composite fermions that's coupled to an internal gauge field with what's known as a chern simons term. Uh, again, these days, you know, a lot of field theorists, high energy theorists, study what's known as matter chern simons theories. So this is an experimental example of a matter chern simons theory, which uh, 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 makes a lot of predictions for experiments, and was, which have been confirmed. Uh, so there's some experimental verification of, these comp of some aspects of this theory. Uh, some of the most dramatic uh, uh, predictions have actually been confirmed. If you go slightly away from nu equals half, then this effective field is not zero, but it's still much reduced from the external field. So the composite fermions will then move in their own cyclotron orbits, but the cyclotron radius will be much bigger than that of the underlying electrons. And that has been seen in experiment. Uh, you can ask whether it's a direct confirmation of the composite fermion Fermi surface. And indeed, uh, there are experiments which rely on a version of the de haas van Alphen effect, known as Shubnikov de haas which confirm the existence of this Fermi surface. Uh, and perhaps uh, equally importantly, there's a successful description based on this composite fermion idea of the most prominent fractional quantum Hall states that are seen in experiments uh, uh, as integer quantum Hall states of the composite fermions themselves. So this is similar to what I described earlier. But you start from one phase, take one of the quasi-particles, and put them in their own interesting balance layer. Right? So here we do that uh, for composite fermions. And it turns out this gives a unified view point on much of that trace of uh, the whole resistivity as a function of filling fraction. Okay? So this place where nothing happens actually turns out to hold the key to understanding the complexities of most of that trace of the quantum Hall effect. Okay? Uh, so this was great stuff, and indeed in the 90s when I was a graduate student, uh, this theory was held as perhaps you know, one of the most intriguing, most successful and weird theories in condensed matter physics. 
right? Uh, uh, and I still think it is. But, you know, there's always something unsat unsatisfactory about this theory, which uh, was mostly swept away, hidden under the rug in the 1990s. Uh, you know, first, why should we believe any of this stuff, right? Other than the experiments. But experiments don't test every aspect of the theory. You know, why should we believe that electrons can grab flux quanta and form weird particles that move in straight lines? You know, from a theoretical point of view, it's all based on totally uncontrolled approximations, right? Uh, so maybe we shouldn't trust it. Uh, now, there's other more practical reasons why people worried about it. Actually, Adi Stern was one of the people who thought most seriously about the, how to fix the theory in the 1990s. Uh, so one issue is the following. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of lander levels, and we are half filling this level. Uh, now, if the electron-electron interaction, if its matrix elements are much smaller than the cyclotron spacing, then it must be legitimate to get rid of all these, to integrate out, to uh, project out all these higher lander levels and define the theory entirely in the lowest lander level. Right? And the theory should make sense physically in that situation. Uh, but this HLR, this Halpern and Lee Reed formulation, uh, that limit of projecting out these higher lander levels looks extremely sick. So it's not clear how, how to continue the theory to that limit in which you uh, forget about all the higher lander levels. Uh, so taking that limit was always a problem. Uh, and people tried to fix this in the late 90s, but the dust never really settled. Now it turns out that uh, if you had such a formulation of the theory purely living in the lowest lander level, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian has an extra symmetry that, of course, the HLR theory is blind to because it knows nothing about the lowest lander level. Right? And this issue is also identified in the 90s and basically ignored for the last uh, you know, 20 years or so. So what is this extra symmetry? So this is what's known as the particle hole symmetry, the lowest lander level. And uh, the idea is that you can build up states in the lowest lander level by either starting from an empty lander level and adding electrons to it, or starting from a filled lander level and removing electrons from it. Right? At nu equals half, we have half the number of lander levels filled. You know, this process of uh, this two different views of the state as either being a half-filled lander level or a half-empty lander level, that there's a symmetry between these two different points of view, and that's the particle hole symmetry. And there's numerical work, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, old work and some very nice new work, which shows that the metallic ground state at nu equals half actually preserves the symmetry. Uh, but you know, the HLR theory has no idea how to incorporate the symmetry within its formulation. Right? So clearly, from a conceptual point of view, something is being missed. So there's a very remarkable idea due to Dan Sohn uh, uh, about a year back, a very intriguing suggestion for a particle hole symmetric theory. So Sohn suggested that perhaps the composite fermion is a Dirac fermion at some finite density. And, that, and he proposed a theory where he said that these Dirac composite fermions coupled to a U1 gauge field, uh, an emergent U1 gauge field, but without any chern simons term in the action. Right? Uh, he more or less guessed this answer. Uh, as I'll argue in later on in the talk, uh, he guessed right. <laughs> so it's a remarkable but correct guess. Uh, OK. Uh, so I now want to give an understanding of this particle hole symmetric composite from a liquid theory uh, by relating it to the surfaces of topological insulators. Right? So so the first thing I need to explain is why this old problem of uh, the half filled lander level has anything at all to do with the three-dimensional topological insulator. Okay? Uh, uh, so let me do that. Uh, so I'm going to show that this particle hole symmetric lander level can arise as the surface of a certain three-dimensional fermionic topological insulator. Okay? So let's start with a free fermion model. Uh, initially free, later we'll turn on interactions. Uh, uh, but unlike a standard model of a regular insulator, or for a regular el electron system, we'll take time reversal to act in a weird way. Uh, for standard electrons, uh, you know, the el el charge density is even under time reversal. So we'll not think about those standard electrons. We'll instead think about a different model in which the charge density is odd under time reversal. We are free to do that, right? So let's think about such a system. Uh, 
And the full symmetry of this system is charge conservation times uh, a weird time reversal symmetry under which the charge is odd. Uh, charge goes to minus the charge. Now the surface of this topological insulator is a single massless Dirac fermion, just like the standard topological insulator. Uh, that's known from you know, uh, a rather complete understanding of free fermion topological insulators. And this uh, weird C symmetry that uh, you know, changes the sign of the electric charge guarantees that the surface Dirac cone, uh, the chemical potential is tuned so that you're exactly at the Dirac point. So in other words, the, 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 you can never be while preserving the C symmetry out at some finite chemical potential. So low energy theory is indeed just a relativistic uh, massless Dirac fermion at the massless point. Uh, and it couples to an external probe gauge field uh, in the standard way, and that's it, right? So that's the theory. So we have this structure where the chemical potential is exactly here. Now, because of this weird action of time reversal that the electric charge is odd, uh, electric current is even, unlike the usual case, it, it's interchanged. Uh, this means that external electric fields are odd, but external magnetic fields are even, okay? Uh, now this means that we can perturb the surface Dirac cone with an external magnetic field while preserving all the symmetries, right? Because magnetic fields in this system are even. Now everybody knows what happens if you take a massless Dirac fermion and you turn on a magnetic field, you get a zero Landau level, right? Uh, a single Landau level that's uh, exactly at zero energy and symmetric Landau levels at positive and negative energies. Now the presence of the C symmetry, which interchanges particles and holes, uh, means that the zeroth Landau level is exactly half filled, okay? Uh, so the non-interacting level, I get precisely uh, non-interacting fermions that fill a half a Landau level. So for low energy physics then, it's legitimate to project out all these higher Landau levels and just focus on the zeroth Landau level. And with interactions, if I now turn on interactions, then I, and I uh, zoom in on just this, state which sits at the chemical potential, that's precisely a single Landau level that's half filled and where the electrons are interacting with each other strongly, okay? So this way, I've obtained my half filled Landau level as the surface of some topological insulator in three dimensions. Okay, it's, mathematically, it's exactly the same problem, but just realized differently. And this is great because we know that many of the properties of the surface of a topological insulator are largely determined by you know, robust physics that can be traced to the bulk, right? Uh, so the picture then is that we have the vacuum, we have this gap topological insulator, and it, this is a gap, right? A topological insulator has a bulk gap. So it's a phase that's relatively easy to understand. And at the interface, we have this possibility of realizing precisely the same composite from a liquid that uh, we've been trying to understand for the last 25 years. Okay? But with the added bonus, that there is a, a, a time reversal like symmetry that it exchanges particles and holes, meaning this particle hole symmetry is automatically incorporated as a symmetry in this context. So the idea then is to exploit the understanding of the relatively trivial bulk topological insulator to learn about non-trivial correlated surface states. Okay, so that's the connection, okay, between uh, t topological insulator theory and composite Fermi liquid theory. Uh, so, I talked about this, I talked about this, and I've talked about this, and I've shown that this is related to this, and I've shown that this is related to this, so it's natural that all three are related. But now, uh, we recognize that the central problem to understand is uh, strongly interacting versions of these topological insulators, strongly interacting surface states of these topological insulators. So once we understand that, we'll, we'll have something to say about composite Fermi liquids in the lowest Landau level uh, at half filling. So how should we study the physics of these strongly correlated topological insulators? Right? We can't rely on band theory anymore right? because uh, they're strongly correlated. Uh, so what should we do? So there's a very useful strategy that's evolved over the last many years in thinking about uh, uh, interacting topological insulators. Uh, uh, you know, the standard topological insulator as we describe it uh, you know, has some electrons that interact with Coulomb interaction or something, but we ignore, in condensed matter physics, we usually ignore the dynamics of the external electromagnetic field with very good reason. We don't treat that 
as something that we integrate over in a path integral. It's really just a probe field, right? Uh, uh, but we, uh, a very useful strategy is to actually promote it to a weakly fluctuating dynamical field that's included as part of the quantum dynamics of the system, right? Uh, and the interpretation of the resulting state, so once we have a dynamical gauge field, not a, not a probe field, but a dynamical gauge field, the correct interpretation of the resulting state is that it's actually a quantum spin liquid with an emergent photon, which is the photon of this uh, dynamical field, and where the electric charge has formed a topological insulator. Right? So we are going to use the connection to quantum spin liquids to understand the topological insulator. Earlier we used uh, topological insulators to understand the quantum spin liquid, but now we're going to do the reverse. Right? Uh, and what we'll do, and what's turned out to be very, very useful to do, is to exploit an alternate description of the spin liquid. So the, the description that I just gave is that I take a topological insulator of electrons, and I promote the global U1 symmetry to a U1 gauge, uh, the global U1, the probe U1 gauge field to a to a dynamical U1 gauge field and study that theory, right? But we're going to develop an alternate description of the same spin liquid using uh, uh, what's known as a duality transformation. Uh, so let me briefly advertise the role of duality, the uses of duality in kinetic matter and field theory. So what is duality, right? So a rough description is basically the following. So when we have two equivalent descriptions of the same theory, but from different points of view, we'll say that th these are two dual descriptions of the same system. So these, this duality is a very powerful way to get non perturbative insight into a strongly interacting theory in many different fields of physics, uh, uh, certainly in quantum field theory. In statistical mechanics, uh, there's a famous duality of the 2D icing model between the low temperature phase and the high temperature phase. Uh, in field theory, uh, say in ordinary Maxwell electrodynamics, it's been known for a long time that you can interchange, say in the source-free Maxwell equations, you can interchange the electric and magnetic fields. So it's a duality between an electric description of uh, electromagnetism and a magnetic description of electromagnetism, right? Uh, 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 now this duality is actually what we'll need, some version of this duality, uh, electric-magnetic duality of ordinary Maxwell theory. Uh, since Maxwell theory is, after all, the low energy theory of spin liquids with, a, with an emergent photon. Right? So this electric magnetic duality is actually very, very useful. Right? But what we'll need is a version of this duality which is specialized to the case in which uh, one of the, my electric charge has formed a topological insulator because that's the state we have. So it turns out that, that for the particular spin liquid that is uh, pertinent for the, this kind of issue, there is a remarkable version of this electromagnetic duality uh, of this, of, for this emergent U1 uh, uh, photon phase. Uh, the standard description that I started with is that it's, uh, the electric charge, which is a fermion, has formed a topological insulator. Okay? Now it turns out that the same phase can equally well be viewed at, from a magnetic point of view. Right? From the magnetic point of view, it turns out that it's also a topological insulator of neutral strength two magnetic monopoles. Right? Now in this phase, there's an elementary strength one magnetic monopole, which for reasons having to do with the topological insulation of the electric charge, picks up some fractional electric charge. But uh, the strength two magnetic monopole, when it's neutral, turns out to be a fermion. And in fact, we'll identify that with the bulk avatar of the surface composite fermion. And it turns out that the same phase can be viewed as not just as an electrical topological insulator, but also as a magnetic topological insulator. Okay, so that's the key. And this then leads uh, uh, at the surface to a duality for the surface theory, which is a generalization to fermion, fermionic systems of a duality that's very famous in condensed matter physics that goes back 35 years uh, uh, in a boson system of a duality between charge and vortex in a two-dimensional boson system. Uh, uh, but now this is a generalization to a fermionic system. And uh, so let me briefly describe the two theories that are dual to each other. Right? So the first is a standard surface theory, which has a single Dirac cone of electrons coupled to this probe external gauge field. Uh, and the second theory is a dual surface theory, which naturally follows from the magnetic point of view of the bulk. Uh, 
And it's written in terms of other fermion fields, which I'll call psi v to distinguish from these guys. And these psi v is coupled to an internal dynamical u1 gauge field. And they couple to the external electromagnetic probe field in, in some other way, not minimally. Right? So the claim is that both these Lagrangians provide equivalent but alternate descriptions of the surface of the same bulk topological insulator. Right? So this is a duality between two different quantum field theories that, uh, as far as any of us know, uh, uh, knows was not described in the field theory literature, but you know it seems to be correct. Uh, uh, again, in case there are high energy physicists in the room, uh, before you panic at this Lagrangian, I, I should add a, some fine print saying that we can make it uh, precise enough for people to not worry about some of the subtleties with this kind of thing, but uh, won't describe it here. So, so now we can apply this to the problem of uh, composite Fermi liquids by turning on a magnetic field. If you remember, the idea uh, was to go to uh, uh, start with the standard surface Dirac fermion, turn on a magnetic field, and, and look at you know, strongly correlated states that can arise when this Landau level is half filled. Right? But now we have a du dual description of this Dirac cone. So let's do this business of turning on a magnetic field in the dual description. Right? So dual description is necessarily a description of a strongly correlated state. Right? So it builds in the strong interactions right at the beginning. So we'll turn on, uh, we'll obtain the half fill Landau level by turning on the magnetic field in the standard surface Dirac cone. So in other words, we start with this theory and turn on a magnetic field, and we ask what effect it has in this dual description. So in the dual description, the, the way the duality works, uh, uh, because of the way in which the external probe field couples to the internal field, uh, uh, when I turn on a magnetic field, the density of strength two flux quanta is precisely the density of dual fermions. Now, Kenneth matter of physicists will recognize that this is the same equation that determines the density of composite fermions in the half fill Landau level at half filling. So what we end up with, based on this dual description, is that the theory of the half fill Landau level is the theory of these dual Dirac fermions at finite density, given by the external magnetic field. And it's coupled, like in this equation, to an external, to an internal dynamical U1 gauge field, but, not, but there's no churn simons term for this internal field. Now that's precisely the theory that was proposed by Sohn, uh, Sohn's uh, wonderful guess for what the half fill Landau level might do. So through all these you know, very intricate connections between many different things, we can obtain a, a justification for this proposed description of the composite Fermi liquid. In a couple of minutes, is that right? Yeah. So for the sake of the condensed matter experimentalists who are in the room, I should descend from these uh, heights to concrete things that people can you know, uh, actually talk about in the lab. What have we learned at the end of the day about the composite Fermi liquid? Right? So uh, uh, to summarize the final physical picture, we now think about the composite Fermi liquid not as a, uh, in a slightly different way from what, uh, from the description that we had in the 1990s. Uh, the old composite fermion was a composite of charge and flux. Uh, now the new composite fermion uh, there's something that had been, people were groping towards that in the 1990s, but it never really uh, uh, was fully done. We instead think about it as an electrically neutral vortex. Now this old object carried the same electric charge as the underlying electrons, while the new object is electrically neutral. Uh, and we think about it as a vortex in the electron fluid, and the composite Fermi liquid is a vortex liquid uh, metal that's formed by neutral fermionic vortices. Uh, and this vortex metal description leads to a very simple understanding of transport in this composite Fermi liquid, somewhat similar to transport in other vortex liquids that some of us have thought about in the context of experiments by Danny Shehar and other people. And it also allow, allows us, based on these insights, to uh, write down extensions to composite Fermi liquids away from nu equals half. For instance, at filling factor nu equals a quarter. <laughs> Uh, where there's no particle hole symmetry, but there's still in experiments a composite Fermi liquid. There's again a neutral vortex theory. 
So this more or less, uh, my last slide, or last but one slide. Uh, so let me talk about real phenomena that people can discuss in experiments. Uh, so the transport is composite from a liquid. Uh, you know, the longitudinal electrical conductivity is, is proportional to the composite fermion resistivity. And that comes about because these are really vortices. So if you think about flux flow in a superconductor, you know, if the fluxes are pinned, you get no dissipation. You get perfect conductivity. So if, uh, if the fluxes move, the vortices start moving, you get dissipation. So it's the same story here. The faster these vortices move, these composite fermions move, the smaller uh, the, the measured conductivity. Okay? Uh, and the whole conductivity is exactly E squared over 2H uh, if there's particle hole symmetry. Uh, it's not approximately that, it's exactly that. Uh, you know, other predictions come about from this theory. Uh, so the longitudinal thermal conductivity is the same as the composite fermion thermal conductivity. And this means that there's a famous relationship between uh, uh, thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity in a standard metal. It's the first chapter of many solid state physics books. It's known as the Wiedemann Franz law. So that law tells you that some combination of these two uh, measured quantities times some universal numbers should be one. Now, in, in the composite from a liquid, it turns out that this combination is uh, uh, different from one by at least a factor of 10 to the 3. Right? So there's a dramatic violation of the standard law uh, in this metal. And I had a very engaging discussion with Moti Heidblum and his postdoc. Uh, looks like uh, that's something they may be able to get their hands on in experiments. It's also interesting predictions uh, uh, based on this vortex metal picture for another a phenomenon known as the Nernst effect. I don't have time to explain what this is, but this is something that could potentially uh, has some chance of distinguishing uh, this new theory from the old HLR theory. Okay, so I hope I've sort of given you a glimpse for some of these connections between different topics that have been facilita facilitated by the understanding of topological insulators. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, you know, I'm certainly very excited about, but you know, so are many other people in the field. Uh, so just want to summarize with uh, saying that uh, uh, these topological insulators uh, have turned out to be a tremendously insightful window into many, many problems in uh, quantum kinetics matter physics. Uh, anytime you want to think about symmetry realization in novel quantum phase of matter, you know, understanding the theory of topological insulators uh, has proven to be extremely important to, to make progress. There's many other interesting applications that, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, that are appearing in other related, actually other unrelated fields like string theory. Uh, but, uh, you know, so this is, I think, a wonderful thing to have happened in theoretical physics. All right, let me stop there. Uh, in the quantum hole system, just the standard model of uh, you project to the lowest Landau level and you just have Coulomb interaction between electrons. The numerical calculation seems very strongly supportive of precisely this kind of uh, composite, Dirac composite from a liquid. Right. So that's the best microscopic model so far. And it's also realistic. <laughs>